How are you? Where are your placements? All Ben Haven? And Chapel Haven. Okay, good. So you're going to see some kids and adults uh, today on some of our uh, video clips that um, will probably remind you of some people you've seen. Not because they are the people you've seen, but because the types of issues and behaviors they're demonstrating are um, relatively consistent. Um, <coughs> and I'm going to give you a little caveat um, about what we're going to do for the next hour and a half or so. How do you guys handle questions? Whenever they want? Good? Okay. I have two ground rules, if you don't mind. The first one is, if you have a question, don't wait. Okay, just ask it. Because 10 other people in this room have the same question, and they're shy. The second thing is, I know you're doing some practice, so you've got some other clients you're working with. If you want to ask a question about one of the people you're working with, I don't mind that, but let's save it till the whole thing is over, and I'll stick around for a little bit, okay? I imagine you've got supervisors on the sites where you are, so you wouldn't necessarily want to come to me with that, because I don't know your clients. But if you had something like that, if you want to ask a question about somebody on the videotapes, um, I can certainly respond to those. If it looks like we're running a little bit later on some of the uh, discussions and everything like that, then what I'm going to do is probably hold a couple of the videotapes, but I'll show them to you as soon as we finish, OK? Because they're kind of fun. Um, and what I want to do is use the videotapes as a way of giving you an example of what we're talking about. We're going we're gonna to spend pretty much all of this time talking about what happens when you've got behavioral issues with people with autism. And you may have heard this from some of the other presenters, but the most important thing I can tell you today, and it's really the take home message, is behavior is communication, and you're going to spend 85% of your time on the assessment side. Okay, because with a good assessment, uh, you will very clearly inform your intervention practice. And uh, with a poor assessment, you may get lucky, or you may be completely off base, and you may end up either encouraging or reinforcing a behavior you really don't want to see, or you might end up doing some harm. And when I say harm, we're talking about problems in learning, problems in behavior, and everything that goes beyond that. And um, all right, there's something that's not doing what it needs to do. Maybe it goes that's the way it goes today. OK. We're going to start with a little story. <coughs> and this is uh, about a, a kid that I worked with uh, a number of years ago. I was called into a school system, um, not up here in Connecticut, it's when I worked down in DC. And I was, uh, I was asked to, to do some consulting around this kid. And the kid had a pretty um, important and problematic behavior. And it kind of went like this. He'd be, he was in a regular classroom, he was in a public school. Um, it's a guy with autism, he's about nine years old. He's got language, he reads, does some academics. Um, in a learning center, which is more or less a special education environment with some integration into the mainstream at various points during the day. <coughs> now. This request for consultation is around significant challenging behavior. And, and it goes like this. The guy is uh, sitting at a table, maybe like one of these, about half that size, four, four students sitting around the table. They're all doing their seat work. Well, in the middle of something, <coughs> our fellow here stands up, grabs a hold of the table, screams the Rosenberg find out, flips the table. Everything scatters, tips, it on, tips the table on top of the other kids. So the. Uh, person who's, who's, uh, who I'm working with, we're, we're looking at this and we're thinking, all right, well, what's the best way to think about this problem? The guy's name isn't Rosenberg. It has nothing to do with Rosenbergs. It has to do with something else. And we have the opportunity to try to sort that out. We go through a process. And the process is really the one that I'm going to outline for you this afternoon, uh, including the treatment side of it. But the process is one of investigation. It's one of asking why questions. Why would he do this? Under what circumstance? What precipitated it? What was the, what were we call the setting events and the antecedent conditions? And when we think about it this way, it allows us to ask questions, pose responses based on observable facts or data. Those are the things that um, we as behavior analysts and psychologists who are working in this field, you sort of live and die by this when you work with significant challenging behavior with people with developmental disabilities. Um, I'm going to use autism today as an example, but you could have an individual who's got Cree du Chat syndrome or somebody who's got uh, you know, intellectual disability by virtue of Down syndrome, any number of other situations. You're going to see some videos of kids who are severely and profoundly typical, who are just typically developing toddlers to, to give you an illustration of some important points. The, the good part of this is that behavior has relatively in many cases, relatively clear-cut um, contingencies. 
what starts it, what keeps it going. And our job as, as folks trying to solve these issues is really to wrap them up and understand what's going on so we can help the kids or adults learn to respond or behave in a somewhat different way that's going to be a little more socially appropriate than flipping tables and screaming the Rosenberg find out. So as we're doing our investigation with this guy, we ask a bunch of questions and we talk to different people and we watch and we observe over several days and we see several examples of flipping the tables. It's not like a one-time deal. Pretty much the same response every time. Now because I'm anchored to this, I can't run around the room, but what would happen typically, scream, stand up, scream the Rosenberg find out, flip the table, run to the door, but not go through it. Stand at the threshold of an open door and watch the chaos going on around them. So you can imagine, you've got kids jumping around, you've got teachers and teacher aides that are getting crazy. He's kind of sitting there taking it all in. In a couple seconds, one of the adults in the room comes over to him and says, all right, Joey, go sit down over there by the books in the beanbag chair and just like calm down. That's the scenario. So we see this very consistent pattern of he's at the table, jumps up, screams, flips, runs, stops. Somebody sends him to the book area to sit in the beanbag chair. It's happened six or eight times. So we're looking at this and we're saying, wonder what that's all about. What are you thinking so far? What are you thinking so far? What's going on here? He wants some kind of a reaction. Good, terrific. Now, we talk about reaction from whom? Anybody in particular that come to mind for you? Maybe the teachers, sure, it could be the kids. Could just be a reaction, right? We don't know yet, but you're on the right track because there was a behavior and there's, a, and there's an effect. We have, a, we have something that started in some way of having an effect. We look a little further and we start asking ourselves questions. What's he doing at the table? This is not happening all day long. He's not flipping tables every time he sits down at the table to do work. So we watch him. He reads. He answers questions. He does math worksheets. And we start to watch the work at the table. And we notice there's one particular time this is more likely to occur. We're going to call that a high probability sequence, OK? The time that it's most likely to occur is when he has a worksheet in front of him that has an open-ended question, OK? Now, we have an example, closed-based and open-ended questions. A closed-based question might be like a multiple choice question, right? Where the universe of possible responses, you know, A, B, C, and D, they're defined for you. You don't have to say, well, I'm not sure where to go with this because the four choices are right in front of you. We call those closed-based questions. Open-ended questions would be like, so what are you going to do today after you finish with this class? Dot, 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 fill in the blank. Write me seven sentences about that, all right? It's up to you to decide, but it's also incumbent on you to organize. Okay, so you have to come up with a gestalt, and then you have to say, ah, oh, well, probably going to go have supper with who, where, immediately or later. Am I going to stop and do some work first? You have to put that all together. This guy <coughs> had pretty reliable antecedent events that included open-ended response situations. That had a written component. So if you had a teacher sitting next to him saying, so what just happened in the story? Was it this, 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 or this? No problema. If he had open-ended, what would you think would happen to the child if the event didn't occur? Write it down, flip the table, Rosenberg find out, to the door, to the beanbag chair, look at the books, okay? What do you think's going on now? It may well be to escape from the work, exactly. It, good hypothesis, and it's actually the one we're working with to start. He may be saying, I'm looking at this work, not going to do it. One way to get out of doing the work is to flip the table and run to the door. Very good. I'm a behavior analyst. At the end of this class, I'm going to show you a graph of response latencies. Yours. How long it takes you to answer the question when I first ask you. I'm just teasing. <laughs> okay. He's getting away from this, and he's zipping to the door, okay? Now. There's something else going on here, and, and it's subtle, but escape from demand is certainly a hypothesis that we want to test out here. But there's something else that's going on, because what else is he doing? He's hitting the door, and then what is an adult saying to him? Go to the beanbag chair and? Uh, it could be a reinforcer. Let's make a distinction between rewards and reinforcers, okay? It's maybe a minor one, but in my book it's going to be a fairly major one. 
It could be a reinforcer. Have you guys had any background on the difference between rewards and reinforcers? So you know that reinforcers do what? Increase the probability of the behavior occurring in the future, okay? That was an intraverbal. That's very close to a closed base question, okay? And you got it, very good. So what we have with this is somebody who says, hey, wow, I get out of this, because I didn't want to do it anyway, and I get to go sit in a beanbag chair and look at a book. Now, I want you to make a distinction for me. If both of them are possibly reinforcers, what type of reinforcers would books and beanbag chairs be? Positive, Positive good. I want you to be a dig a little deeper on that. Do you get the same feedback? Do you get the same neurological feedback from reading a book as sitting in a beanbag chair? Has anybody here not sat in a beanbag chair in their life? Okay, good. What's it like? What's it feel like to sit in a beanbag chair? Say? It's relaxing. What does it feel like? Not what does it think like. What does it feel like? Comfortable. Okay. It's kind of mold to your body. Okay. Kind of smushes in. Can you think of a difference between sitting in a beanbag chair and being smushed into that and having somebody give a really tight squeeze and a hug? You know what kind of sensory information you're getting from that? It's called proprioception. Okay, basically joint compression or deep pressure. The information that goes into your joints, goes to your brain, says, I know where I am physically in this environment. I'm sort of wrapped, okay? It's like when we have little tiny babies who are very dysregulated after they're born, and even when they're not dysregulated. What do we do with those blankets? We swaddle them, exactly. We wrap them up tight. Do you know why we do that? Because babies have a startle reflex. That when they go like this, it scares the daylights out of them. So if you swaddle them, they don't get scared. They're much calmer, OK? That's all these people walking around with babies and papooses and kangaroo babies and everything else like this, there's meaning to that, all right? So what we've got is a guy who's getting a reinforcer at two levels. Read the book, sit in this really cool chair. Pretty big payoff, but for what? Good behavior, bad behavior? Problem behavior, you betcha. Now, you're the kid. You're seeing the teacher walk over with the handouts. She's going to put them on a the table. You take a quick look. You see it's open-ended. What are you thinking? You're thinking, I know how to get out of here. And I know how to get what I want. Because they consistently give me the beanbag chair and the books. I like the beanbag chair and the books. There's one very clear way to say that to my teachers. It is Rosenberg, find out, flip the table, and they'll give me my books. So if I'm a person with autism and I'm saying, I'd like to look at the books now, one way that I can communicate that, clearly, perhaps not adaptively, but clearly, is do the behavior that's problematic. Everybody understands it. Therein lies the problem. Okay, That's the problem that we confront. So when we start talking about what people with autism might do or people with developmental disabilities might do, what we're really looking at is the purpose behind their behavior. We call that purpose function. Okay, and you're going to hear me talk about function, functional analysis, functional assessment pretty much all afternoon. When we talk about folks with, with autism spectrum disorders and behavioral issues, we have to remember, first and foremost, if you have an autism spectrum disorder, it is a social learning disability. Yes, ma'am? Right. Punishing him would not take away the thing that was troubling him initially. That's right. So, so if they don't, if they hadn't figured out exactly what it was that was stressing him, but they had figured out that like this was a reward that was coming for him, and it was going to keep reinforcing that he could do this. What might they be able to do to free up his cycle? Okay. How many of you guys are psychology majors? Who's not? What are you guys in? Spanish? Okay. Biology. Biology, okay. Uh, gotcha, okay. Biochem, okay. Everybody in here wants to help somebody, right? You want to help them talk, speak better Spanish, and you want to make them better biochemists or whatever you guys do with your lives. Uh, you, you make all of us healthy, which is a good thing, which in my case is a very good idea. 
Here's the thing. You all want to help people, so you have a natural tendency to jump to an intervention before, you're, if before it's time, which is exactly what you did. And I'm not faulting you for it, because all of us are going to do that. We're going to say, okay, what do we do? You know what the answer is at this point? You don't. You understand it better so you don't make mistakes. Now, you asked a really good question when you said giving this guy some sort of a punishment procedure is not likely to address the trigger, the antecedent, right, of, of, the, of the behavior itself. So we could punish him until the cows come home, but every time he sees that paper, he's going to have to think, maybe I'll take the punishment because I'm really had it with this paper stuff. What if I told you that the, there are two other important things we have to do, change the antecedent and change the adult behavior and teach him a new behavior? Now, what is flipping the table, screaming the Rosenberg find out, saying? What's the communicative intent? Louder? Before that. Bef who? I don't want to do this work. You said it before. I don't want to do this paper. Maybe it's also saying, I want to go sit in a beanbag chair and read the book. Let's just say for argument's sake, initially, it's saying, I don't want to do this work, or I don't know how to do this work. Fair enough? Are we good? Tell me an alternative response that you, as that student, could emit, could do, to say, I don't want to do it, or I need help. What could you do that would be socially acceptable? That's exactly right. OK? Did you have some kind of a class when you were a little kid to teach you hand raising? Did you really? Where'd you learn it? Did you pick it up in kindergarten? You probably did. OK. And why are you using it now? Most of you, when you had a question, raised your hand. Why? Yeah, you're not that nice. Why do you use it? Because it works. It's functional. It's what we call a pivotal response. I know what hand raising means. You raise your hand. I'm going to say you have something you want to ask because you need help, or you don't understand, or you've got to use the restroom, something. But it's an attention cue. It's an attention signal. And I know what it means. I didn't take a class in hand raising any more than you did. But I did learn it by observation, modeling, and reinforcement. Okay? I didn't learn it by punishment. I learned it because when I raised my hand, I got somebody's attention faster than when I flipped the table, screamed the Rosenberg find out. When we start talking communicative intent, we have to go, to get to your question, we have to go back to what is he trying to say to us? That's why I said to you, behavior is communication. He is saying, out of here, need help, can't do it. If he raised his hand without flipping the table, what would be the most likely thing you as a teacher would do? Would you ignore him? You're not sure. Don't teach Spanish if you would ignore him. Not good. What's that? You would walk over. You'd go allow him to solicit your attention, your, your assistance, and you would do something about it. Now, if you did something and it made work easier for him, what's his payoff? I.e., what's his reinforcer? If you help him with the work, is it easier or harder than if he does it himself? It's easier. OK, if it's easier, that means there's less effort on his part with greater success. You will do the things that are easier for you to do and also have them maintain high correct response rate success. Okay? You'll do that. Right? Organisms do that. They go for what's easy and what works best. That's all we have to work with. If you take that example, pretty much everything we talk about the rest of the afternoon is going to start to hang together. We good with your question? Okay. This is a social learning disability. A lot of behavior in autism, and because I know you've heard a few lectures before I got here, you know that the range of capacity in autism is tremendous. Some of you are working at Chapel Haven, so you've got some individuals who are, to say that they're high functioning is an understatement. Some of these folks you know, wrote the book on IQ, and they can do things in their heads that we can't conceive of. On the other hand, they may do that with absolutely no understanding that there's a social engagement that goes on with this, that you have to participate in some meaningful way to share what you know and are doing with someone so they want to do it back with you. The social learning disability and the misunderstanding of social context is one of the biggest problems that we deal with in autism that affects the behavioral issues. The second thing is 
And another concept I'm sure you've heard is that folks with autism don't necessarily know that you're thinking the way you are. They may be thinking you think like they think. Now, I know that was a rather convoluted thing, but I want you to think of having to take someone's perspective and what that requires you to do. Okay? It requires you to think about how someone else is experiencing something as opposed to your immediate experience. And the importance of that as a core issue in the social disability uh, in the autism spectrum really can't be understated. So if we have someone who says, well, what's wrong with flipping the table and screaming the Rosenberg find out? Well, it's not exactly what you see in school. And then if I said to you, what's wrong with the Rosenberg find out as a phrase? What would you say? Why is that a bad communicative strategy? Doesn't communicate anything about what you want or need, true enough. It doesn't, well, if I, if I have autism, and that's my phrase, works for me, right? Mind blindness is the person with autism saying, it works for me, it must work for you. You read my mind. You know my mind. Mind blindness is, I don't know that you don't. Okay? The phrase, the Rosenberg find out, is a very specific type of social communication problem. It's called a neologism. Okay? It's a word made up by someone to mean something. Okay? So we have lots of neologisms in autism. They go all over the place, all over the map. But the bottom line is the person with autism is thinking, you know what I'm trying to say here. And you as the teacher or you as the student sitting next to him are saying, I don't know what's going on. This guy's wild. Okay? This is dangerous to be around here. The third thing is that executive functions are generally compromised in the world of autism. So if you have somebody who has difficulty looking at a situation and deciding what's the most relevant piece of information here. You have somebody who doesn't necessarily take experiences from, from the past that they've had and apply them to a new situation in a somewhat flexible or modified way. You have somebody who doesn't scan the environment for somebody who's being successful and say, I will just hang around that successful person and I'll do okay. okay? That's the problem of executive functions and they're rampant in autism. The fourth thing is that we have this tendency towards rigidity. And if, if you've done anything with Ben Haven, are you, some of you guys going up to Ben Haven and Wallingford for the school? Okay. With with uh, Karen, Helene. Okay. And some of you are, are some of you going over to the uh, to the residence. You've seen some folks with autism who are a little rigid here and there. You know behavioral rigidity. And certainly, you've seen that with some of the individuals at, at Chapel Haven who are very capable. You know, things have to be a certain way. Okay. That rigidity, that's not pestiness. That's like air. That's a necessity to organize oneself to respond. Okay? That's something that's very important to the person. Now, that might lead you to think, well, fine, if that's what they need, let's give it to them. But rigidity isn't very adaptive in the environment because if you're rigid in your access to the environment, you can only access highly predictable environments which means you can only go to the places that you really know and understand. You don't get out of your orbit, out of your environment. And if you think about what a lot of people with autism do, is they fail in novel environments. They could look really good in familiar environments, but they fail in novel environments. And, and that particular problem is, is called a lack of fluency. You can't use your skill in a variety of novel settings. And it uh, doesn't serve folks with autism very well. When we think about behavioral interventions, we absolutely, positively, wrap it around learning and social environments for assessment and for intervention, treatment, planning, development. Now, behavior has lots of purposes. The stuff on the left, from aggression all the way down to vocal and motor tics, that's what you're going to call us about. You're going to say, I've got a kid, he bites. Or I have a kid, and he flaps his fingers, and he does this. Or he kind of, this is a great room for this. If, if you have autism, you'd have a field day in here, perhaps, because we got verticals, we got fluorescent lights. I can do all kinds of things and make patterns with my hands. I can make this room very visually stimulating without even talking to you guys. And I could sit here and do this and really get off on it and enjoy it and not be thinking, does this group of students think I'm nuts? Do they think that this is just not what a professor does? And not, not only not think it, not care to know, because I'm more involved in getting this type of visual sensory feedback that I'm looking for. Okay? That's part of the problem we see. But 
we often get these requests or the, these, re um, the, these calls to consult or solve the problem when people identify the behavior in question. So they say, we've got aggression or we have pica. You know what pica is? Ingesting inedibles. So people who eat cigarette butts, not chew on, swallow. Okay, or coins, um, rocks, stones. You know, it's fairly dangerous behavior. Uh, we're not talking about people who like chew their shirt. We're talking about ingestion. Self-injury, non-compliance, you know, you name it. Those behaviors are problematic and they get in the way, they're stigmatizing, they're dangerous, they're minimally, they're annoying. And when we've done some research on looking at, so when we have behaviors, where do they go? We find that for the majority of individuals with autism spectrum disorders, escape from demands is the most likely function, purpose behind, reason for the behavior. So we find that people will do th behaviors to get out of doing other things that you want them to do. Fair enough. We also find that when we look across a whole, and this is about, oh, we're talking about uh, a couple hundred individuals in this particular sample of a, of a study done a number of years ago. If you just take access to tangibles, okay, which is I want a certain thing and if you don't give it to me, I'm gonna have a fit, okay? You've got almost 50%, 44.5% of the individuals in this particular survey, their behavior was maintained by, triggered by, wanting access or wanting escape. I want what I want and I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. Okay? That is a very common finding in the world of autism. We do have people, however, who engage in behavior problems <coughs> to access social attention. They do it for purposes of obtaining sensory feedback or what we call stereotypies. And then there's a lot of behavior that's multiply functioned. We think about the Rosenberg find out. That behavior was actually multiply functioned. Okay? You said escape from the task. And young lady in the back said maybe he wanted the access to the attention or the reading of the book or sitting in the beanbag chair. Perfectly reasonable. This is negative reinforcement. You're talking about positive reinforcement. And by the way, why is getting out of doing the dirty work with the open-ended question negative reinforcement and not punishment? Have you guys tackled that yet? Who drives a car? Whether you're here at university or somewhere else. All of you have seatbelts? What happens if you don't put the seatbelt on? What happens if you turn the ignition on and you don't put the seatbelt on? What? The car dings at you. You have some sort of an audible signal? Most of you? Okay, that's good. You're driving cars that are post-1970. That's a good thing. <laughs> okay, so you have a noise that happens. Do you like the noise? Do any of you like the noise? What do you need to do to make the noise go away? Sorry? Put on your seatbelt. You had to click it, right? Okay. What is the aversive stimulus? The noise. What do you do to terminate the aversive stimulus? You put the seatbelt on. Is wearing your seatbelt considered a positive or a negative behavior? Is it appropriate or not appropriate? Okay, so negative reinforcement is terminating an aversive stimulus, all right, in order to get reinforcement. What's your reinforcement when you put the seatbelt on? It stops, exactly, the noise goes away. So you're saying, oh, thank God, all I gotta do is click my seatbelt to make this aversive contingency go away. So what we've got is removal of an aversive contingency, all right, that you have control over and you do something good to do that. And that's a, that's a good pro-social behavior, but it operates on the context of negative reinforcement, which is exactly what's going on here. Now the tricky little thing is as soon as you do that, this kid flips a table and he runs over there and they tell him to sit down in the chair. We have two things going on. He's reinforced because he doesn't have to do the work. You tell him to go sit down in the chair and now he's quiet. Everything's calm. You, the adult, are reinforced. Okay, we have a very dangerous trap going on here that people fall into all the time. And it even has a term, it's called the negative reinforcement trap. More on that a little bit later. But at the end of the day, if we don't analyze these individual, what we call contingencies, you might say, don't flip the table, I'm gonna put you in timeout, which will not change this behavior over the long term. It'll lead to symptom substitution. All kinds of problems, all kinds of consequences. You can have educational access that you lose, you can have social access that you lose, you can get into trouble with the law, um, you can you know, break things and people make you pay for them. Please? Uh, 
to what? When you say the word they, you mean folks with autism here? Yeah. Got it. It makes perfect sense. Is that the intent? Is that what you took from what I said? Right. You got it. OK. <laughs> Everybody in this room responds to negative reinforcement contingencies. Okay, and everybody in this room seeks positive reinforcement contingencies. All right, some of you don't manage them well, and sometimes you're more negative and people leave you alone. And if you like being left alone, that's a really good strategy, except you won't have any friends after a while. On the other hand, if you really want to be around people and you're crabby all the time, you don't get what you want. The, the key difference in here, the, the one distinction I want to make is I, you added something in which you may or may not have intended to say in the same way, which is of lower intelligence. Don't make an assumption about intelligence when you talk about autism. Because there's a, there's a term that I'm going to use with you, and you may have heard this before too, multiple intelligences. I want you to think of people with autism from the context of multiple intelligences rather than a global intelligence factor or something like, like G, okay, that we would say, well, there is an IQ. The world of autism is far too variable for that. It's much more common to have somebody who's got absolutely breathtaking visual perceptual skills and can, clo can see something, close their eyes, and reproduce a schematic of that like this, but have horrifically bad verbal skills and can't have a conversation. Okay? And the literature is full of individuals like this. So what I want us to be thinking about is people with intelligences or domains of intelligence and domains of deficit, okay? Rather than a global. And I think that it, I don't know if you are at Chapel Haven or at Ben Haven, but if you're a Chapel Haven, you're running across some folks who are, you know, working on six cylinders in some areas. And even if you're at Ben Haven with some individuals who are very significantly compromised, you also know that there are some, some fellows there and, and women there that can do things you say, how can that be? The person can't handle any situation that demands flexibility. They have no language, a lot of behavioral problems, yet they can still whatever they can do that's exceptionally good. Really, that's the paradox of autism. Okay, it's what makes it so uniquely different than intellectual disability in its most straightforward form is the variability. And if you're somebody like me, and you know, this is 36 years that I've been, I've been working with kids in the autism spectrum and adults in the autism spectrum, that's the thing that makes me get up every day. It's, it's the wow factor. It's like, how'd you do that? That's really cool. Well, to this, um, we move to some basic assumptions that build upon something that you were saying, which is if behavior is communication, then we also recognize that behavior is a relationship between the person and the environment. Behavior doesn't occur in a vacuum. And when I talk about environment, I'm not just talking about physical environment. I could be talking about internal environment. Anybody here had the flu yet? Hope not. Did you? Ouch. OK. Um, in the early part of your flu, you guys that had the flu, uh, did you go to class some days when you were just starting to get sick? Were you at the top of your game? Probably not, right? Because you're still feeling kind of punky about you're not even sure why you're not feeling good, and then all of a sudden you get real sick. Okay, and then you finally hopefully stopped going to class and got a little better. Maybe not. You could have an internal environment. Illness is an environmental setting, we call it a setting event, that can affect your performance. So if you had been really doing well in a class and studying and getting great grades on tests and quizzes, and you go sick and take a test and you bomb, have you become dumb? Or is it your illness that's interfering with your attention, focus, and short-term working memory? Probably the latter, OK? We call the illness a setting event or an establishing operation. More on that later. But it is an important variable. And if you don't think of those variables, you'll be saying everything is outside. It's peripheral to the person with autism. Well, we have some internal issues. We have people with neurocognitive deficits. They have right brain, left brain discrepancies. We have people with poor right hemisphere abilities and great left hemisphere abilities, and vice versa. If you know that, you have a way of thinking about how this person with autism thinks. If you don't know that, you're throwing mud at the wall and seeing what sticks. You're hoping you can figure it out. So as we gather this kind of information, the more we get, the better we are. 
if you're going to intervene, you address the variables that are functional to the situation, which is why in the situation you described, we got a guy who's trying to escape from a demand, and we say, fine, you want to escape, I'm giving you time out. Now, I want you to put yourself in the place of the person with autism in that situation. Right? You don't want to do this. You get upset, you say, I don't want to do it, you, you misbehave, and I say, fine, time out for you. What have I just done? Really? Come on. Were you happy to get the time out? Or were you not so happy? Yeah, why? You were happy, why? Because you didn't want to do it anyway. So what did I functionally, what did I do functionally for you by giving you time out? I gave you an escape. I, I run the risk that I just gave you a functional reinforcer, don't I? Okay, because it increases the likelihood that you're gonna try to get out of doing the work in the same way, because you're gonna get the time out. So we have someone who does a misbehavior. We say, fine, time out for you, and the person's going, yes. Or they understand me. The communication works for this. Those are the, uh, the pitfalls that we're, we're really trying to stay on top of because it happens regularly. Okay, let's hope for the best. I think we should make this work. Okay. Now, this is really the basics of what we're talking about. I want you to watch. What's going on? Hmm? What's the problem? What's the target behavior? What's the problem behavior? The, the child is doing the problem behavior. What is it? Yeah, it's having a tantrum. Nobody's ever seen this before, right? You've never seen a tantrum. Okay, come to my house. Um, okay, we have tantrum behavior. What is the learning contingency that is maintaining that tantrum? Sorry? He gets to stay on the camera. You think it's being on camera, okay. Who else? He's getting adult attention in the form of, for him, he perceives positive attention, negative attention. Probably positive attention. It's positive reinforcement, right? So positive reinforcement through social attention here, right? And what this little guy is thinking is, hey, whenever I see these people, if I fall on the floor, this is going to work. Fair enough? You watched about seven sequences. I can show you 12 more if you want to see them because it goes on for a little while. Now, at the end of the class, there's going to be a little jar over here. There's, I want you to put spare change in it because it's for his therapy fund because uh, this kid's going to need it when he's older because he's basically, for infinity, he's on, uh, on YouTube here. Um, this is a very straightforward example of problem behavior maintained by social attention. When we, as clinicians, are looking to understand problem behavior, we say, what happens after the problem behavior to increase the likelihood of its future occurrence. 
And what is setting the stage for it? Now, what if I said this kid is super tired versus just got up from his nap and is really well rested and he's well fed and he's pretty robust? What if I told you that in this situation, the kid is super, super tired? What would part of your intervention include? Letting the poor little guy have a nap, right? <coughs> All right, but what if I said to you, not tired, he's not hungry, he's got access to all kinds of good stuff, then what would part of your intervention include? Or not include? The naps, right? If we want to change this behavior, what is one of the things we have to do? We have to change the relationship between when he tantrums and when he does or doesn't get attention. Okay? That is a basic, that's a basic intervention strategy here. Okay? So that's one of the things that we're going to be thinking about. When we look at behavioral assessment and treatment, this is not a linear process. It's really a circular process that never ends until you decide that you have a replacement behavior that's accessible to the, to the child or the adult with autism, and it's fluent, meaning it can be used in a variety of novel situations. When you assess, you get information, you develop a treatment plan, you go ahead and do the intervention plan, you treat. And then finally, you move to an evaluation phase. And the evaluation gives you information that reinforms your assessment. When you're reinforming assessment, you're continuously changing what's going on. Now you can imagine that in the case of that little guy, we change one thing. What if, we had, what if I said to the parents, all right, I want you to put this behavior on extinction. No attention whatsoever. From what you know about basic principles of extinction, what is that behavior likely to do in the beginning? Exactly. Why is it going to get worse? And what do we call it? We call it an extinction burst. Why is it going to get worse? Think like the kid. Don't think like an adult. Think like an 18-month-old kid. Hey, they didn't hear my scream. These poor people, they must be doing something else. I'm going to ramp it up six or seven notches. Then they'll really pay attention to me, OK? That's kid think. That's the way these things work. That's why extinction bursts work, all right? What's the worst thing you do with an extinction burst? Behavior's climbing, what's the worst thing you do? Give attention as it's climbing. You know why? You just reinforce persistence. Because the kid's saying, all right, the little stuff, it doesn't get what I want, the big stuff works, the next time I'm going right for the top. Okay? Kids are smart. They're way smarter than we are. So that's what's going to happen with it. If you think about this as you're going through this rubric for figure it out, develop a treatment, evaluate the treatment, reinform your assessment and treatment plan as you go, you'll be getting the right idea. When we do behavioral assessment, we do behavioral assessment for three reasons. We want to predict what's going on. As we intervene, we want to be able to say, all right, I know what's going on. I have a pretty good plan. But I want to inform my ongoing intervention. That's that, that circular loop of new information adds to my thinking about my treatment plan and its effect. And we want to provide this information so we can make readjustments. We then want to be able to do a summative evaluation in our behavioral assessment formula, which says, I understand what happened. Now, there's good reasons for having a summative assessment, even when the problem is now gone, particularly in autism, because we can have behaviors that change form but retain function. Now, let me explain what that means. Let's say instead of flipping the tables, I engage in self-injury, OK? And I slap myself in the face, OK? And I slap myself in the face, and I slap myself in the face. And you get rid of face slapping. But now what I'm doing is I'm biting my wrist. And I'm biting my wrist. And then you get rid of that one. And then I'm getting into property destruction, OK? That kind of a sequence of substituting an alternative form happens when we don't address the function. So if I don't get at the very basic fact that this guy in the Rosenberg find out cannot do open-ended graphomotor tasks, if I don't get at that problem, I will likely have new behaviors that substitute for flipping the table and screaming the Rosenberg find out. I'll get something else, all right? However, if I intervene at the level of the complexity or the, the processing demand of the problem itself, I will remove the reason for those behaviors. Does that make sense? That's behavioral assessment and treatment. Thinking about what causes it, altering the contingencies, 
So the behavior no longer is functional. There's no reason to scream the Rosenberg find out. Work's not hard. Or if work's hard, I raise my hand, you help me, and I say, whoa, that worked. I'm going to raise my hand when I need help. The guy comes over. Okay, that's a lot easier than running around the room and having people upset with you. When we do behavioral assessment and treatment, we're going to first think of changing the environment. Okay, we look at the target behavior, we say, hmm, got this guy sitting at a big table with four other kids, four other students. What's one environmental modification I can make just to the physical environment? What comes to mind quickly? Four kids at the table. Let him work at his own desk. I could reduce the, the crowding, okay? From anybody who's done any basic animal research, what happens with crowding? What does it generally do to arousal rates? What does it generally do to stereotypic responses? It ramps them up, right? Okay. I mean, for that matter, it also increases cortisol levels. So you've got poor response sets. You've got poor adaptive responses in highly crowded situations. Now, most of us would say, well, four kids at a big table, not so crowded. But what if you are overstimulated by physical movement and you see people moving and you watch people move and it distracts you from your task and you can't get back onto your task because people are moving around and it's an unpredictable visual field for you. There is a problem. That could be an aversive event in autism. Might not be for you or me, but it could be for someone in autism. The second thing that you do is you manipulate contingencies. Now the contingencies we talk about in this particular case are escape from demand and positive reinforcement. So we want to do something to tinker with those. We want to change the escape consequence, all right? And we want to turn the escape consequence into a positive behavior that gets what he needs, which might be assistance when he raises his hand, as opposed to no assistance and return to the work when he flips the table. Because right now, flip the table means work is gone, right? That's what you said the reinforcing contingency was before, and you're absolutely right. So now we want to say, flip the table, you do the work again. Instead of flip the table, the work goes away. That's reversing a contingency. We also want to say, raise your hand, I help you with the work, I make it easier. That's adding a positive contingency for a more adaptive and, I would say, adaptive and functional behavior. We teach a functionally equivalent alternative response. You identified what it was. You said, raise his hand. That's a very common one to use. And then finally, we want to teach a behavior that will address long-term needs. And, and the reason I use the Rosenberg find out is it basically helps us wrap all this up. Because here you guys are, right, in your you know, 13th, 14th, 15th year of schooling, and you still remember how to raise your hands, okay? And sometime you're going to be working someplace in a large meeting as a professional, and you're going to raise your hand. Hand raising to solicit attention or assistance has longitudinal value. And in this culture, most cultures, many cultures, it's a socially acceptable way of doing it. Most people are going to pay attention to you. When they give you attention, you reinforce your hand raising. The natural consequences are fairly evident. Now, skip what's written, because there's a lot of 50 cent words in here. Here's the basic concept. You guys had the flu. You didn't feel so good, all right? Maybe some of you are sitting here saying, I didn't have lunch today, all right? I'm really having a hard time paying attention. Or, I not only had lunch, I had four desserts. And I'm about to hit a hypoglycemic low, and it's going to get ugly, all right? That is a setting event, all right? It is not an immediate trigger stimulus. It's not the immediate antecedent. It is what occurs before that that sets the stage, okay, for the likelihood that reinforcement will occur or the likelihood that punishment will occur. And that's why we call it a motivating operation because it, it establishes or it sets the stage for the next operation. It could be a reinforcing or a punishing operation. We say operation, we're basically using the same word as contingency here. The easy ones we think about are, so how are you feeling? Are you hungry? Are you tired? You know, have you had the wrong foods to eat? Some of you guys had eight cups of coffee today. Some of you had maybe none, all right? And your caffeine levels are a little better. Jamie and I were talking before. I, I just came back from um, working in Italy and uh, where we have three projects going on. And one of the things I get to do in Italy is I get to drink espresso the way you're supposed to drink espresso. But I don't drink coffee americano. I don't drink, uh, you know, big cup of coffee. Basically, I'm doing shots. But I'm somebody who really likes coffee a lot, not a little, a lot. 
and I drink a lot of espresso. And it doesn't affect me to have 12, 15 espressos a day. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing. But if I were to have the equivalent amount of caffeine in coffee here, I'd be non-functional. Um, I, I think it's a volume and the short burst that goes through. I just sort of keep on a constant fuel cycle with it. Um, hey, for better or for worse, it, I could show you this exact same lecture done on 15 espressos in front of a, you know, an audience of 300 people in Italy with simultaneous translation, and I probably wouldn't be talking any differently. It's just one of those things. But the reality is that some of these things set the stage for better or poorer performance, and they are, they are internal events, okay? Some of them are external events. Some of you guys working at Ben Haven have clients that you work with who have schedules of their activities, right? Picture schedules? No? Okay. All right, let's say that you know, you're working. Um, are you in a classroom? You're in the residence? But there's a schedule in the residence for activities, right? Let's just say you go in there and you say, hey, you know what? I'm smart. I'm in uh, molecular biology. What, what are you in? What's your field? Biochem. All right, I'm in biochem. I know more than these psychology geeks who are doing this autism stuff. We're doing away with the schedules, okay? And behaviors go off the wall. Now, what's the relationship between schedules and behaviors going off the wall for a bunch of people with autism? Why would they have anxiety? What does the schedule give them? You're right on the mark here. What does it give them? A sense of control, and I don't mean coercive control or manipulative control, but sort of knowing what's next. Let's say structure, routine, and predictability. Schedules give you that, okay? Some of you people have PDAs, you've got other kinds of things. I'm more basic, I have lists, and I make lists. If any of you make lists, nobody here? Do you? It's not a 12 step program, some of you make lists? Okay. What do you do with your lists when you finish stuff? Why do you cross them off? It, because it feels good? OK, good. That, that, well, at least there's honesty here. Good. And now you cross them off because it feels good. Do you cross it off because you finished it? <laughs> OK, it's not about the work, just how I feel. It's OK. So you cross it off because you finished it. And as your list gets crossed off, what are you doing? You're completing your tasks. as the number of cross-offs increases and the uncrossed-off items decreases, what do we call that? Progress, right? We call it, move. it's a progression of time and task. If you have a schedule for a person with autism and they're starting here on the schedule and they're working their way down and as they complete an activity, they take the picture away or the words away that, that um, identify that particular task, they're doing exactly the same thing. Now, I don't want any hands for this, but some of you guys, when you make these lists, because you're gonna cross things off so you can feel good about it, you put things on the list you've already done. So you cross them off right away, okay? There's about a quarter of you in here that do that. It's not because you're bad people. It's because you just, <laughs> you just need a lot more reinforcement to motivate yourself, and, and it's really okay to do that. You have my permission to do that. When you have a behavior issue, a lot of times people say, well, what was the immediate trigger? You'll only get so far if you think of those immediate triggers. You have to move up a level to ask, what's the physical context? Think crowding. What's the social context? Think sarcasm. Tell you about that in just a second. What's the biological context? Think illness. OK. So let's see. We'll pick somebody out in here I haven't picked on yet. Um, the lady in the back who's really typing madly on there, I could say, because you have a pendant on that's shaped like a heart. I could say, wow, beautiful pendant, right? Or I could go, beautiful pendant. Same words. What differs? Tone, good. What else? Affect, good. What else? Don't think words. Think face. Yeah, well. Facial expression, sure. One was a little friendlier. One was a little not so friendlier. OK. What's the most important piece of information? The words? No, not the words. Because the words are the same. Tone, facial expression, affect, volume, voice, all of that comes together 
as social context to say, in one, he was giving a compliment, but in the other, maybe he was being sarcastic. Wouldn't that be rude for some guy you've never seen before to walk into your class and be sarcastic about your pendant? What you might go on to thinking all kinds of things about what a not nice or nice person I might be in other situations. Depending on how I give you either one of those two responses, that's context. Now, that informs any of these. And you need to know what these are, or you're going to short yourself on understanding this. You need the background. So if you think about what's going on in the macro, and we think about this as more macro, and now what's going on in the micro, the immediate trigger that sets it off, you have a better understanding of the experience of the person with an autism spectrum disorder in that behavioral moment. Now in behavioral assessment, we do four things. I'm going to tell you about them, then I'm going to go through them. We're going to have some videos as we go through these two. An ecological assessment, a motivational assessment, reinforcer, and then a functional assessment or functional analysis. Is anybody in here has anybody in here been involved in doing functional analysis before? As in a contingency reversal? Or came from a, a behavior, behavioral background anywhere else? Or is moving towards that? Okay. Or worked with little autistic kids where you did ABA or anything along those lines? No? You did? Okay. As a home tutor? No. It was a summer camp. Okay. Functional assessment, functional analysis are some of the things that we get really involved with to understand learning as well as behavioral issues. We talk about ecological assessment. Where it's, I want you to think macro. What's the big picture telling us? And we do several things. We look at the physical environment and we say, what in this physical environment might set the stage? With the Rosenberg find out, we said, where's the kid sitting? Is it crowded? Is it noisy? What if I told you that instead of the paper that I brought to the kid that was open-ended triggering him, it was his classmate who hums coming into the room and sitting next to him, and he's constantly humming. And that's the trigger, OK? Whenever he hears the hum, he flips the table. That'd be a different intervention. One of the interventions that you might suggest would be, how about we move the humming guy away from the guy who's flipping the tables? Or what else could you do to the guy who has to listen to the hum? To soften the impact of the hum. Huh? Yeah, earbuds or headphones or something that kind of puts white noise behind it, drowns it down. OK. The next thing we look at are antecedent behavior consequent conditions, just called ABCs of behavior. OK. And we're looking to see, does the behavior have a reliable or predictable set of things that almost always trigger it? Does the behavior itself look fairly consistent in its presentation? And what are the typical consequences that occur? When we do an ecological assessment, we often find that there are very reliable antecedents and very reliable consequences. OK. Because behavior, believe it or not, is fairly predictable. Most people do things the same way over and over again. They just don't think about that. The next thing we do is look at the learning environment. And in the case of the Rosenberg Find Out Kid, that learning environment involved a cognitive task of being able to process open-ended information, construct a rubric for producing a graphomotor response. Really complex if you think about it in those terms. Now, For this guy, he may have been able to read it and talk it, but not write it. If you work with somebody with Asperger's syndrome, the problem of being able to speak an amazingly coherent paragraph, but not write more than three sentences would not surprise a lot of us. OK? Because in Asperger's syndrome, a graphomotor deficit, right, uh, could be part of a right hemisphere inefficiency, is a very common thing to have happen. And then finally, a temporal analysis has to do with, when does this occur? Early in the day, right after lunch, right before lunch, only on Mondays, OK? Only on Wednesday mornings, but never any other day of the week. And then you go back and you do a little looking and you find out, wow, mom and dad don't live together. Uh, no, mom and dad do live together. He's got an intact family. But every uh, Tuesday night, he goes and stays with nanny and grampy. And nanny and grampy are nannies and grampies. And they do whatever he wants. No contingencies. You know, It's free for all. And the kid comes in the next morning thinking, get whatever I want. I just did. All right? And so what we have now is the infamous nanny and grampy interventions, which have probably more to do with fixing this behavior than working on the kid. Okay. When we have a motivational assessment, we're asking questions about what makes this behavior go, what makes it happen. We have several things we can think about. The first that we described is positive reinforcement. It can be social attention or stuff. You are reinforced by what I give you. You really like these little kind of neat pointers. 
and I give it to you. And then um, you play with it, and you shine it at people and do things like that. That's a positive reinforcer for a material reinforcer. Social attention, however, is all about us. You do things, and I respond to you, and you do more of that, and I respond more to you. Okay? Escape avoidance of demands is exactly what he did with the written work. Reinforcer loss is really a subset of this one. I separate it for a very important reason, because behavior that is maintained by losing access is what we're talking about. So you're playing your Nintendo DS, and uh, you haven't hit the level yet. And if you turn it off or close it up, you're going to lose all your points thus far, right? This is what my seven-year-old tells me. He says, I can't turn it off and go start my homework because I'm between levels. And since I can't do the DS, I know I'm getting scammed, but I don't know how to beat this problem. But I know, he's, I know he really can to stop this and save it, but it's, uh, it's a trick you play on your parents, and they, they lose all the time. The loss of access to something that you like, a material thing that you like, or you say, I want it, and I say, not now. You have to wait. You can't have it now. That's a problem that is, is about reinforcer loss. The next one has to do with sensory consequences, reinforcement, or negative reinforcement. Sensory reinforcement is um, I am much more interested in the way this looks than talking to you. And I will do this for a really long time. It doesn't make any difference to me what you think, what I think. I like this. It's giving me what kind of feedback? Let me just tell you what I'm doing. I'm looking through my fingers, and I'm looking at that light, and I'm going like this. What kind of feedback am I getting? Visual, good. What type of visual feedback? Remember, fingers to light. I'm going to give you a clue. If I look at my fingers, if I focus on my fingers, something different happens to the background with the light. But if I focus on the light, I have eight fingers. I'm getting a what? A little figure ground distortion. Okay. You with me? Try it. I'm the guy on YouTube. You're not. <laughs> All right. It's my life. All right. You can do this in the privacy of your own home. I lied. You're all on YouTube, but it's going to go up in about a month. So you do this, and I'm getting a figure ground distortion that's kind of close to 3D, isn't it? Right? You see things in different dimensions, stereoscope. Is If you're a five-year-old and you're on the playground and you're doing this against the trees or against the leaves that are blowing uh, on the trees, what do you think other five-year-olds are going to do with you? Typical five-year-olds. They're going to run up to you and say, wow, can I do that too? You don't think? They might make fun of you. They might avoid you. If they're five and they're nice, maybe they just won't even play with you. They'll just say, hmm. You know? By the time you get into seventh grade, that's when they make fun of you. Now, what can I go buy at a store right now? Toys R Us, KB Toys. What can I buy at a store that has been around for 30 years that provides really good figure ground feedback that has context? that other children would want to play with if you had it. A kaleidoscope, perfect. What else? It, the viewfinder thing. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it, it's, yes, and it's, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Sorry? A viewmaster, thank you. I lost it for a second on there. A viewmaster is, is what you're thinking about. And I go and buy a you know, Disney princess little disc, and I put it in there. And all the other little kids who like Disney princesses come over and they want to look at it. I do this. I generate avoidance behaviors. I do a Viewmaster with an interesting disc in it, and I generate approach behaviors. For the kid on the spectrum, both stimuli are providing similar visual perceptual feedback. Part of the intervention is often to understand what's maintaining the behavior at that level at the sensory level and saying, can I come up with a better alternative that will access pr approach behaviors? Okay? Part of your intervention is to bring them to the child and still give the child things that they're looking for. Classical conditioning certainly happens. Think fears and phobias. And organic factors certainly occur. Um, we got a little guy right now who we just finished a sleep study actually down here. And uh, he has obstructive sleep apnea. Okay? But nobody was thinking about that. They were just thinking about this little kid who was tantruming wildly. The problem was he was having so many episodes of obstructive sleep apnea that he had no REM sleep. He, had, he, he would drop into REM, he, he would awake, he would snort and awaken, and he'd pop right back up again, 
and he basically couldn't recharge his batteries, and this was going on for years, and he was a very unhappy little boy, okay? And you know what the intervention was? Tonsils and adenoids, okay? And the, uh, the docs said, we got a kid with obstructive sleep apnea, he's got tonsils the size of uh, oranges, and let's make those go away. And uh, lo and behold, you have a physical intervention for a physical problem that affects behavioral output. You don't want to forget the fact that human beings sometimes have these events, physical events, that get in the way. We look at assessing stimulus preferences which as reinforcer assessment. That's something we were doing when I was showing you the, uh, the, uh, the hand flapping episode. And you came up with an alternative, which was get him a Viewmaster, get him a kaleidoscope. When you think of stimulus preferences, you say, what is the information the person is getting to guide what they're getting afterwards? Reinforcers that you pick have to be common, have to be available, right? Because if they're not, they're exotic, they're not going to be in the natural environment. So I may be able to teach you guys in this class how to do something because I have something that you can't get anywhere else. So by virtue of novelty, I shape your behavior. But if it doesn't work anywhere else, it's not going to generalize the behavior. There'll be no fluency. Reinforcers have to be functional, meaning that they work, they increase behavior, and they really need to be age appropriate. Now, functional analysis is the process of answering the question in an empirical way, why does this behavior happen? Okay, that's what this is all about. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the four FA vignettes at the end. Okay, if you want to stay for them, that's okay. If you don't, I understand that too. They're useful to the extent that they give you a real life in clinic uh, observation of how we do it and what the child's response is to that. But what do we get when we do a functional analysis? Well, we find out with empirical validation, this is essentially having controlled conditions. It's a little experiment. Actually, it's four little experiments. You have a controlled condition where you do something and get the response from the child. Or you don't do something and you see what the response from the child is. Okay? So, I look at this child with the Rosenberg find outs behavior and I say, I don't allow him to escape. What happens to the problem behavior? Whoop, up through the ceiling. In other words, I keep saying, nope, just keep working on this worksheet. Or as soon as he starts to get fidgety, I say, hey, don't worry about the worksheet. Go take a break. Behavior ramps right back down again. On, off, on, off. I watch the behavior rise and fall, rise and fall. What I'm doing is experimentally validating the hypothesis. The second thing we do is we find out what consequences you're maintaining. We're able to look at what we call chains of behavior. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you what the chain was for this guy because he'd be sitting in his chair, he'd be working kind of nicely. I bring his worksheet over, put it down in front of him, start to see him fidget, a little agitation, kind of like this, pushing the paper away, pop. Okay? Scream, jump, run. If I want to intervene at an early point, in the behavioral chain, where do I go? At what point do I intervene? Do I wait for him to scream and jump? Maybe when I saw him start to agitate. Okay, Once the paper was down, you know, he could be having a good day. He might do just fine. But if I start to see the agitation, and I'm saying to myself, predictably, reliably, that agitation is a precursor to the behavior blowing up, and I've documented that. And how do I do that? I'll document that with an ABC analysis. Then I say, okay, now I know where I'm going with this. If I intervene here with assistance, before he blows up, I'm able to capture the behavior, respond to his need before he has exhibited a problem behavior that I then have to respond to for safety reasons. Okay? We have high and low probability situations that we find out when we do a functional assessment. We say, when is the behavior most likely to occur? When is it least likely to occur? We look for functionally equivalent behavior. What's a thing we can teach him to do that gets the same communicative payoff, but is more adaptive and successful? Raise your hand, is more adaptive than flipping tables. These are the conditions in a functional analysis. And you'll see four of these conditions when, when I show you the tapes a little bit later. We've got a time when there's nothing going on, we don't do anything to you. There's no consequence for your behavior. We have a situation where the kid's playing by themselves. The kid en engages in the problem behavior, right? And the adult responds to it. You know, oh, don't worry. It's OK. Don't, don't be concerned. But for appropriate behavior, we don't do anything. We only respond with social attention to the problem behavior. 
In this situation, we get the problem behavior, we give them something. So the kid's trying to get something, we put all the fun stuff out of reach. The kid says, I want it. The kid starts having a tantrum, we say, oh, here you go, and you give it to him. You want to play with it for 30 seconds, you take it away, you put it back up there. The behavior ramps up again, you say, okay, here you go, you give it back to him. You manipulate his behavior with access to materials, and then later we're able to compare does it get higher or lower when it's social attention versus materials. See where this is going? We're able to experimentally validate in about two minutes for each of these times two or three. So we're talking about what, five times two, one, two, three, four, five times two is 10 times three. In 30 minutes, we can have a three-part experimental validation of the effect of our attention, escape on demand, materials, or nothing at all. The last couple conditions have to do with does the behavior occur when there are no consequences going on. So this one down here is designed to elicit stereotypy if it's going to occur. In other words, he doesn't care about the material or you. This one up here is essentially a baseline condition where it says free play. Okay? Okay, we're going to move past that for a second. You can do several things to get this information. You can look at comments people make. You can review records. You can have interviews. You can do some fairly formal structured things. There are several we use. Um, they're available commercially. They're short and sweet. They're all based on Likert scales. You know, never happens, always happens, five points with some degree of, actually a very good degree of inter-rater reliability and validity for each of these. The motivation assessment scale and the functional analysis screening tool, the MAS and the FAST, are the two most common ones used. Okay? They have each 20 questions. You circle the items. The items are loaded for behavior that occurs because of attention versus escape from demand. So for example, on both of them, there's a very similar question. Does this behavior occur in order to get your attention? Or does this behavior occur when you're in the room with other people and you're talking to the other people, not the target child? And if you circle always, you're beginning to load towards social attention. Alternatively, there might be questions that say, does this behavior occur when the child's doing some, uh, you give the child something difficult to do and won't take it away, okay, which is escape from demand. You have a number of questions for each of these, and they're, they're loaded up into a little scoring algorithm, and they give you a hypothesis. They don't tell you the answer. Now, why don't they tell you the answer? How are you gathering this information? Direct observation or talking to people? Talking to people. There's no direct observation here. One of the things that we don't want to do is limit our assessment to talking to people. We want to watch, see, and observe. When we get to a descriptive analysis, we're doing the watch, see, and observe. An ABC analysis that I mentioned to you a little earlier, something called a scatter plot, and I'll show you both in a second. And then we can do direct observation. So if I was doing direct observation in this room of people who are looking at the screen, I could be watching the clock in the back, and I could say whenever the clock hits one of the uh, numbers, in other words, it would be a five second interval. I, I'm talking to you guys, I look at the clock, and as soon as it hits, I look around and I see, are you writing or not? All right, I'm sorry, are you looking at the board or not? And I just put a little plus or a minus, and then it hits the next number, I take a look at you. For the intervening five seconds, I don't care what you do. But on that five second mark, I will watch to see for the occurrence or the non-occurrence of your behavior. That's what we call a time sample, all right? And it's one of several different ways of gathering objective information that we then aggregate to form some sort of a behavioral profile. We won't spend a lot of time on this or the next one because I think they're fairly self-evident. When you have an, what's called an ABC analysis, you see the A, what happened before, you see the B for the behavior itself, and the C for the consequence, and a little description down the bottom. When you have an ABC analysis, you are taking one real-time event and writing it down. So one flip of the table with the Rosenberg find out. Right here we say the kid was sitting at the table uh, doing his thing. He, he screamed, the Rosenberg find out, flipped the table, ran to the door. What were the antecedents? Well, time of day, who he was with, what the date was. He's sitting at the table. It's after lunch. Um, I bring over the, uh, the Halloween worksheet and say, what are you going to be for Halloween? And he's got to fill it out and write me five sentences about that. Flips the table. Then what do we do? What do we do. 
We tell him, go sit down in the beanbag chair. What does he do? He gets quiet. We do 10 of these. Then we look for patterns. If we do 10 of these and look for patterns, we're going to find patterns most likely in the antecedent and in the consequences. Jamie, I think this is, no, it's not that one. I just have a hard time shooting this in here. Antecedents and consequences are going to give us patterns. If you had to choose, should you intervene at the antecedent level or the consequent level, which one would you choose first? What do you think? Yeah? Why? At the antecedent level, why? You'll get it before it happens, right? Sure. It's a good idea to intervene where you can at the antecedent level so you don't have to deal with consequent responses. Now, recognize, of course, that this is human nature and there's fallibility involved all over the place. But you do want to be able to get to the behavior before it happens and maybe get to the early part of that chain, like the fidgeting we were talking about, OK? A scatter plot is nothing more than pulling information on a time series. So when this behavior occurs, by day, by block of hours here. This, instead of hours on this side, I could have activities. But all we're doing is putting a, a, t a tick mark on here. Nothing more than a check, OK? We're looking for aggregated volumes of behavioral events. We do an FBA, we gather all this information, we pull it together in a way that has some coherence, and we do that so that we can say what's making sense. Now there's a downside to this too, because it's fairly time consuming. You may accidentally or intentionally reinforce problem behavior because remember, if the behavior is to, in the functional analysis, if the behavior is to gain escape and you don't allow escape, you will increase the behavior. All right, you make a judgment as to whether that's a safe thing to do or not. There's training demands because you have to be very valid and very reliable with this, but you will experimentally confirm or disconfirm a hypothesis. That is the power of doing a functional analysis. Now I'll tell you at our clinic, at our center, we have a specific clinic for the assessment and treatment of severe challenging behavior. We don't do functional analyses on a regular basis. We do them for, as it were, the, the worst of the worst behaviors. We'll do a functional assessment, which is basically to say, Let's get the hypothesis and test it in situ, in real life, all right? It's a lot easier to do in a school. It's a lot easier to convince people that it's a reasonable place to go. But what you'll be able to do with a functional analysis is to demonstrate with a fair degree of reliability and validity what's going on. Now, you get all this information, 85% of your work, and now you've got to do something with it. So you have to link your interventions into a treatment plan. And the reason I show you this this particular slide is, is just to emphasize that for the particular function, you have a particular treatment plan. And you may have two or three of these. You may have a behavior that's, as in the case I gave you, there's both escape and access to positive reinforcement operating, and you've got to have two integrated components of the treatment plan. So you have to be thinking ahead to know how do they work together. When you do this, and I guess there's really three take home messages. Right? The first one is that behavior is functional. The second one is communication. The third one is when you're doing behavior management, you are really doing teaching. You have to teach an alternative. If you don't teach an alternative, you're leaving the client with nothing. Okay? If you make behavior go away, in a practical sense, you're saying to the person with autism, figure it out on your own. Figure out what to do next. Now, it's a social learning disability. They're not likely to pick the right social behavior to, to demonstrate for you. If it's based on function, not form, what it allows us to do is to say we have particular skill sets that may be linked together. Different behaviors may be linked together by function. We have general rules for intervention we consider. The first is function is preeminent. The second is what's called the fair pair rule, which means if you take one away, you put one back. You always replace. If I teach you not to flip tables, I must teach you what to do instead. And the third thing is, and any of you who work with kids or have worked with kids in the past, if you keep people busy and happily engaged, you'll have fewer behavior problems. So as long as we think ahead to functional engagement, replacement skills that we teach, and looking at the functional application of those skills so we can evaluate them effectively, we're in good shape. If you have communication, skill teaching strategies, social teaching programs, a behavior support plan is integrated with that. As you were suggesting in the back when I talked to you about the schedules, routine, structure, predictability, order, control, 
those are elements of stability for a person with autism. The more we provide each of those in the person's experience, the more, the more appropriate behavior we're going to see, but we're also going to see more likely demonstration of behaviors that have been taught. So if we teach someone, schedules guide your day. Transitions happen, but we can, we can describe them visually on a schedule. When you've got a schedule, you can handle the transition. That's one of the things that we can do for a person with autism that, that makes for lower arousal rates. You'll call it lower anxiety, I'll call it lower arousal. The same concept is going on here. Conversely, when we have a breakdown in structure, routine, predictability, order, or control, we're likely to see behavior problems. So if I said to you, we've just had a breakdown in all those things, and now we've got this behavior going on, what's one of your first thoughts about intervention? What can you do to try to bring behavior back to a better form? You could increase the structure, predictability, routine, control, order of the client's experience to simply bring them back to what they expect, bring them back to what's predictable. If we look at adult behavior, and the example I gave you a little earlier with sarcasm, if we look at the adult behavior and say, is it consistent or not, we often see the chinks in the armor of problem behavior that we create, not the client creates, that we create. Okay? We've got a guy that we're working with right now who has some very serious aggressions and property destruction. He's little, he's nine years old. But one of the reasons he does is he works in a room. Um, if you guys can see the room, that little space in the back, it's smaller than that, and it has shelves and cabinets in it, and it's a little nine-year-old kid with two adults in a room that size. Okay, talk about crowding. Has no natural light, has only fluorescent light, and he can't get out the door. Okay, so we've got big behavior problems going on in this kid's life right there. And one of the things that we have to recognize is some of the circumstances that the program he's in may have created for him ramp up the likelihood of that behavior. He simply can't move, all right? He has no way out of that. We sometimes teach people various kinds of strategies to compensate or to, to move beyond the behavior, which involves self-management, sometimes relaxation <coughs> strategies, sometimes what we're going to call a personal timeout. Now, as we think about our intervention plans, we are necessarily going to think about four things. We have to change the communication. We have to change what the client says and does all right, and how they do it so it works better. That's called functional communication training. And we're going to teach a better, better response. That response, as you suggested, was going to be hand raising instead of flipping tables. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to teach the replacement skill. Remember the fair pair rule? If you have a new skill you want to teach, you have to use reinforcement strategies to build that skill. So you're going to teach the child or the adult to do something different that more likely elicits the response that they want. You're going to modify the conditions around the behavior. If they're tired, you give them sleep. If they're hungry, they get to have something to eat. Or perhaps it's crowded. Perhaps there's no schedule to follow. Perhaps there's no other way of them knowing what's coming next. And you address that as an antecedent condition. And then finally, we recognize that there are going to be consequences because not all behavior can be highly predictable in anyone's life. And we recognize that our consequence strategies have to be highly, highly socially valid, meaning that they must be accepted by the consumers in the environment. And by the consumers, we don't just talk about teachers or parents. We talk about other people in the environment, the uh, social environment of a school, a community, a neighborhood, whether this particular behavior itself is considered aberrant whether the intervention strategy is considered acceptable, and whether the outcomes we seek to achieve are considered socially acceptable, socially valid. We have to use the least restrictive interventions as can be used, because to euphemistically um, you know, kill a fly with a cannon is kind of pointless, but you can have very heavy-handed approaches misused in, in dealing with problem behaviors, and what you end up with is reinforcing escape. Now, if you come all the way back to what the autism spectrum is all about, we have a group of people with a social learning disability who have problems with social interpretation, who are more likely to be confused by the social environment. So now in addition to their confusion, we give them punishment contingencies so they want to escape more. Makes no sense. So the use of punishment procedures is really something that we approach in a minimalist way. 
And as you suggested a little bit earlier, we go after the antecedents. On the equation, the left-hand side of the equal sign is where we're headed. We recognize that we have to deal with the right-hand side, but we recognize more that the left-hand side of that equation, the antecedent or the environmental conditions, are going to give us more information and more strategies to move forward. When we talk about treatment planning and some of the things that we're going to do with treatment planning, we recognize that we have functional communication training where we teach someone an alternative. So in teaching this young man to raise his hand instead of flipping tables, I come all the way back to the idea that I have to give him a way of getting um, my attention when he needs it before he flips a table. And I'm going to give him a hard task or something that requires him to do a written response. And I'm going to be there to coach him to raise his hand, and then I give him the attention and reduce his demand. We conduct that particular intervention much in the same way as we would conduct a functional assessment for a behavior problem, but it's simply a functional assessment of communication. When behavior is maintained by reinforcement, whether it's positive reinforcement for social attention or whether it's materials themselves, we give someone escape from that reinforcing stimulus. So if you're going to misbehave to get my attention, like that little, that little kid on the video, I'm not going to give you attention when you're misbehaving. But when am I going to give you the attention? When you're, when you're not misbehaving, when you're not tantruming. That's when I'm going to give you plenty of attention. So I want you to learn there's a contrast called behavioral contrast where we say, from the child's perspective, I behave this way, it's sweetness and light. I behave this way, there's no attention. This way, no attention. Yes, no, I want the attention, I will behave this way. We get to apply reinforcement, in this case a differential reinforcement procedure, to teach an alternative behavior, which might be getting attention in a more socially acceptable way. If the behavior is maintained by escape, we absolutely identify that we have to not allow escape to be successful, because it will strengthen the behavior. So what we're going to do alternatively is we're going to try to make the environment rich with information so the child says there's no need to escape. I don't want to escape from this task because I like being in the task so much. I get help, the task is fun, the materials are preferable to me, okay? And something that provides a significant reinforcement for staying in the game versus leaving the game. In the case of behavior that's maintained by loss of access to reinforcers, we have access to reinforcement is available predictably throughout the day and can be earned, okay? But not freely accessible. Okay, we put it on what's called a contingency for time. And when we do that, we also recognize that we're going to teach children and adults to wait to get what they want. Okay, just like we all have to wait for things that we want, we can't have them immediately in most situations, we're going to say that we're going to teach someone that waiting is a skill to be acquired. When behavior is maintained by sensory consequences that are escape from a sensory event that is aversive, you have to attenuate it, ramp it down. Those are the headphones or the earbuds that we talked about before. Or you teach people to mitigate the over-arousal effect of that through exercise, systematic desensitization, relaxation training. Um, the last point here, paired stimuli, is pairing that aversive event with a highly reinforcing stimulus. So you'd say, I'll put up with the aversive to be in this. Okay? One of my, uh, my older children says, that's what happens to guys when they go to chick flicks. Right? They really don't want to be there at the movie, but they're going to eat a lot of candy and popcorn to put up with it. So it's like, okay. If that's what you have to do to put up with it, it's, it's okay by me. Um, he is managing pretty well with, the, with that whole system. I don't know how long it's going to last him, though. But it, it's working for him at the moment. When you have automatic positive reinforcement, which is this is under my control. This is stereotypy. This is the hardest nut to crack. But you have to substitute something for it. This is the Viewmaster example. If you substitute something that is socially appropriate and more accessible, then you have the opportunity to teach the child, get, this in this, get your information this way, your sensory information one way that's more acceptable, than this other way, which will cause people to run away from you or to not want to engage with you. We allow them to earn sensory reinforcement if necessary, but we make sure that we enrich the environment. Okay? Enriching the environment is a very important thing to do. But in autism, sometimes environmental enrichment means we have to think like the person with autism. What are they like? What are they looking for? If we give them that information and make it accessible, we have a much better chance of bringing together what they're looking for. Now, I recognize that we're also, I think, running short on time. We're running out of time. So I'm going to leave you with 
a little bit of a wrap up and then if you want to stick around we'll either talk or I'll show you a couple of the videos. The most important things I want you to take home from this are that you can understand why behavior occurs by looking at the immediate trigger and the setting events, the contingencies in the environment that operate beyond that, above that at the macro level. Those could be reflective of the client's ability to predict what's about to happen, their physical state like hunger or illness, um, their ability to, uh, to experience and respond flexibly to novelty versus things that are more highly predicted. But at the end of the day, you can begin to investigate that in some very systematic ways. One of the systematic ways is called functional behavioral assessment and in its more advanced form, functional analysis. These allow you to know. They allow you to generate hypotheses, which you then test. As you think about behavior, think about communication. Behavior speaks. Behavior tells you what's going on. You then become the student, and your client becomes the teacher, because your job is to listen and interpret. What does that behavior mean? In all likelihood, for a person with autism, there's a high probability that the behavior will be consistent in its meaning. So it generally means something that the client understands and knows, and you can come to know. The last point about this is interventions come and go. And if you've been in the field, like a lot of the people that at the Child Study Center for a very long time working in autism, all kinds of interventions are proposed, whether that's certain kinds of diets or it's certain kinds of uh, activities or hyperbaric chambers or you know, drinking cod liver oil is going to you know, relieve symptoms of autism. At the end of the day, you live and you die on the science, okay? If there is good science, good evidence that's well constructed to support certain intervention practices, use it. If there's not, you may choose to use it cautiously, but you'll apply an empirical rubric to that. You will engage in hypothesis testing and analysis in order to determine whether what you are doing led to what you wanted to see happen, the outcome that you achieved. The final point in this is it's not a good intervention if it didn't work. You can always analyze why something doesn't work. But if it's not effective in bringing about the outcome that you seek, it was not an effective intervention. It needs modification. Okay? You've been very patient. Sorry to keep you and run over. Any of you that want to stay, and I'll show you a couple of videos, I'm happy to have you. But have a great rest of the day, and, and uh, thanks for being attentive.